one. Father, as just as you are in me, I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one in them and you in me, so that you may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Thank you, Rose. <clears throat> Let's start with prayer. Father, we do thank you so much for your love, for your mercy, your grace, and that your plan for us was complete. We just thank you for what Jesus did on the cross. And Lord, we pray that the power that you have given us to live a life of worth, of glory, and honor to you, to be a light to the world, that we'll just realize that it is the power of God that we have the privilege of sharing that message with you. We thank you for this church. We thank you for your spirit. Just We pray, Father, that your words be spoken to us today and that we hear them and apply them to our lives. And we just thank you for the time that we can worship you and the time we can have together as the family of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you did not see the movie, shame on you. It started out with... Billy Graham's salvation and then went in. And when he started out preaching, he had no clue. <laughs> and the preacher that, that he got the calling under, conviction under, to become saved in the first place was one of those preachers like this. That scared Catherine. <laughs> you all and he tried to start off that way and his sermons were about a uh, minute, because <laughs> he didn't know what to say after that. It's a good movie. If you need a copy or anything, let me know. This looks like a real good movie, too. And today we're going to talk about unity, and it looks like next week's thing might be about faith, so we'll see what direction God gets into. But today I want to talk a little bit about unity, perfectly joined together. And last week we mentioned um, about that we have a choice to make. And that we have to choose wisely. And I praise my God in heaven that so many people chose widely, wisely. We had people that don't normally come to Bible study come to Bible study. I praise my God. Um, we've studied Acts chapter 1, 1 through 9. So it's kind of appropriate today we look at that and look at verse 10. Because verse 10 is kind of where Paul puts it all together. Here's a church struggling, no different than any church, because we all sin and fall short of God's glory. And he says, remember who you are in Christ. Remember who God is, His power, His love for you, that you're His child, that you've been completely given everything you need to make it through this journey in life, this calling that I've set you apart for. I've set you apart to be holy, just like... In the Old Testament where the vessels were set apart to be holy, holy enough that when someone touched them or they touched something else, that object became holy also, set apart for God's service. And that's exactly what Paul says that Christians are, that they're set apart for the glory of God, for His purpose, for His will, completely equipped for it, given all gifts. So why in the world would we quarrel over gifts or anything else? But why would we not realize who we are in Christ, a family of God, brothers and sisters with Jesus? And then we get to verse 10. So I'm going to start out reading the first nine verses, and then we'll start digging in on verse 10. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified, which means set apart, made holy, saints, in Christ Jesus and called to be His holy people together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that means no matter what denomination, as long as they believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, that we should be able to get along with them enough that we can teach the gospel message, that we can have this unity, so that the world sees the truth of the gospel message. 
Verse 3, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of His grace given to you in Christ Jesus. For in Him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I said in Bible study, Paul could have stopped right there if we realized what he's saying. Who we are, who God is, who we are in Christ, what He's done for us, His plans to redeem mankind, that we are part of that, that we will see forever peace, joy, love, perfect in heaven because we are His children, that's our inheritance. And we should realize that as a family, that you are my brother and sisters in Christ. But see, the problem is, is who do we argue with the most many times? Our family. So we have to remember that and we have to humble ourselves and we have to realize God's plan and His power to live through us. If you notice in those verses, verse 5 is the only one that doesn't say Jesus or Christ or Lord, but it says in Him, so it's implied. Every single verse in those nine verses says it's all because of Jesus. It's all through Jesus. The power, the grace, everything else is because of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And just as God promised Christ the Savior, because if you'll notice in the first verse it's Christ Jesus, not Jesus Christ. It's the fulfillment of God's promise to send a Savior, the Messiah, Christ, to the world. And that took care of everything. We just have the privilege now of living out that life. And we tend to say at times, oh, I can't understand why the Old Testament is in the Israelites, they one minute worship God and the next minute they were worshiping their idols. Hello, examine yourself before you point fingers. Because we do the same things. We just don't make those brazen images. One minute we're praising God for all there is and the next minute we're saying, why Lord, why me? Where are you? Do you not care about me? (laughs) He cares about you. He cared enough to make His Son come to earth and die for you. And Jesus was 100% obedient, 100% subservient. Why? Because He has the attributes of the Father, which is love for you and I. Every last one of us. So God is faithful. It also says in verse 8 that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's not because of your works of righteousness. You can find that elsewhere in Scripture. It's because we have sinned against God and the only one who can put blame on us, blameless means lack of blame, is God. But if we believe in Jesus Christ, if, if we truly do and realize that and live that, there will be no blame because there's no one that can blame us. And nothing that can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 9 said, God is faithful. It's all about Him. He is the one who has called us into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And that fellowship means intimacy. To get to know someone like a husband knows a wife. Like we know our own kids. We are all part of the family of God. And we need to realize that and love one another and be with each other in the hard times and the good times, celebrating the love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what Paul said. He could have quit the letter right there. But see, we have to be told plenty of times, (laughs) here's your problems since you don't want to see the truth in that statement. So we go through the letter and we find out what some of their problems are and And the answer is found in verse 10 right here. He said, I appeal to you, brothers. I beseech you. I beg of you. Listen to what I've said. Brothers and sisters, you who fellowship with God, who fellowship with Jesus Christ, who have the power of God living inside of you as His very own sealed children. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we've got got Jesus again in the 10th verse, that all of you agree with one another. In what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Here's how the New Living Translation says it. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church, rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. 
And the King James reads this way, Now I beseech you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. How can a bunch of people who are different, different likes and desires, who are (laughs) self-centered, I am, so I'm pretty sure you are, how can we get along? That's just, that's impossible. But when the world sees that unity and the love of God and a changed life, then that's going to get them questioning. They've already not listened. Read Romans 1. They've not listened to the glory of God that is declared in all of creation. They want to write it off and say, oh, it just happens with time. Let's add more time to it. Or whatever their answer is. Or there's many ways, or good enough is good enough. And I'm not as bad as them, but see, Jesus is the plumb line or the mark there. No one is righteous, no, not one. So we've got to live a harmonious life acting as the body of Christ. That means we need every part, every person given the gifts to do their part to make this body whole. In the King James Version it says, starts with, Now I beseech you. Because see, he's, he's given who you are in Christ Jesus again, who God is, this plan of redemption. It was a mystery before. And he said, now is the time. This is the world we're living in. This is the age of the church, the kingdom of God here on earth. Now I beseech you, I beg with you, I plead, I reason, <clears throat> that you brethren or brothers, those who are part of the family of God, who have been adopted, who are His very own children. Those who have said, I choose to be a disciple of Christ. Teach me, Master, Lord, Rabbi, so that I may follow in your teachings, in your footsteps. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the name that everyone will recognize and bow down to, because Jesus is the one who set all things right, because He's the only one that could. So by His power and everything, we all speak the same thing. Now what does that mean? Does that mean we need to be mindless robots? That we need to not question each other or anything? As a pastor, I want you to question me. Because then we can go talk about this further. So that I hope that you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Because I know the rest of that verse. It says, you will be filled. I hope that you're studying to show yourself an approved workman unto God. I want you to be all that God has called you set apart to be, holy, for His royal priesthood. So we can speak the same thing. We can have some disagreements on this or that, predestination. You you girls talked about the other day. Woo, what a topic. (laughs) But we can talk about the love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's how I can worship with the Methodists or the Presbyterians, whatever, as long as they believe that. And you better believe I make sure they believe that. But if we have that one mindset that God is who He is and that Jesus Christ was His plan of redemption and you are called to be His holy set-apart people, then we can agree to to disagree, but agree in, in unity. and there better not be any divisions. Because see, we can be united and still have divisions, right? We're a family. We can all get along. (laughs) You put son and daughter, I'll say daughter-in-law so you don't think that my son married her daughter, but I always call her daughter so she knows how accepted she is. And grandchild in there, we don't get along quite as much as we do when we're separate. But there's still unity there. And then it strives to say here that there be no divisions among you. Because, see, we can't have that and still have the unity. That means that we can't be rent, split, or torn in two. Because what good is it if you rip my arm off of my body? I can't use that arm then. And it's possible that that arm may die or my body may die. So it's telling you here to not be rent. No divisions among you. But instead, 
to be perfectly joined together, to put that arm back to the body, to mend it, to make it whole, to make it what it was intended to be, restored and whole for God's purpose, for His glory. <clears throat> Basically, Paul's been telling the Corinthians that remember who you were. You were poor, naked, wretched, blind, pitiful. You tried to obtain salvation by your works of righteousness or whatever the reason was, by your false gods, whatever. But I have provided that way, God has, because of who He is. And it's all through Jesus Christ. He's done everything for you. But you still have the choice that we talked about last week. And you have to decide if you're going to choose wisely or choose poorly. You have to decide this day if you're going to choose life or death, blessings or cursings. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. When the world is against you, and it looks like that's what that movie's going to talk about, and I didn't have any clue what it was about. <laughs> Michaela wanted to play it. Looks like that's what's going to say when they're facing things. As he said at the end, he said, I'm going to walk. Will you walk with me? So I'm excited and looking forward to seeing it. <clears throat> he also told them in that opening scripture that, that, that they were one church, one body, but they belonged to the total body of Christ. And we need to realize that in this world today because we get so separated and, and set apart that we can't work together as the body of Christ. And oh, how this world needs us to be united telling them about Jesus Christ. Because God didn't send His Son before to condemn the world, but to save the world. But there is coming that day when Jesus Christ will return. He will judge. He will take His children, His brothers and sisters, home. And see, that first ch church realized that. They thought that He was coming back at any moment, so there was that eagerness. We better hurry and everything. And well, it's been 2,000 years and we get complacent. But guess what? If it's been 2,000 years, we're that much closer. We should be just as much, if not more, eagerly waiting for the day of the Lord to come. Which means we have an urgency to tell others why we still have the chance. Not to build up worldly treasures and build up castles built on shifting sands, but to build a firm foundation so that our children do see it, so that our friends see it. So that when that day comes, they're going along with us because they have believed in Jesus Christ. And they will do that more than anything, not from your words of righteousness, but your acts of love. That's why Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, and that is to love one another. That's not new. Well, wait a minute. But then he said, as I have loved you. That's totally new. Wow. That's going way off the deep end, and I can't do that, but I can do it with the power of God living through me. Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That doesn't mean win a triathlon. That means face all the things you face in life. Because God is there and He has done it through Jesus Christ. It's already been accomplished. It is finished. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So that on that day we will be blameless, without blame, without blemish. Totally right in God's eyes. Wow. So if we realize that, then we should work together to tell each other, and the world about Jesus Christ. Welcome to the family of God. First thing is salvation. Coming to church regularly won't get you there. Doing good deeds won't get you there. Personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why Nic Jesus told Nicodemus, He said, you must be born again. Nicodemus did not even ask the question. Because Jesus said, you must be born again by the Spirit of God. <clears throat> Let's look at it this way. If I have a child and I, adopt, I have a son and I adopt a daughter, I have given her all rights and privileges of being my child. Now that doesn't mean much there, but it does in the family of God. It means everything. But if she doesn't live like my daughter, then we've got division and unity, don't we? And she isn't living to what she was called to be. I chose to adopt her. Not because anything she did or anything. And if she doesn't really act like my child, 
then does she really appreciate or even believe who she is? Does she believe she's a Henson now? Because see, our, our actions do speak much louder than our words. There's a problem here, and we're gonna, as we go on into Corinthians, we'll see these problems. Paul doesn't mention the problems yet here. He tells them who God is, who Christ is, and who they are in this picture. And then he makes his plea. I urge you to be united, no divisions, perfectly joined together. That's what church is. In Philippians chapter 2, we read what Paul writes to that church. He says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from His love, any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, if you have any of these things, just a remote amount of any one of these, then make my joy complete by being like-minded so that the church is not divided. It sees its purpose and it's united in that purpose. Having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, the complete opposite, in humility value others above yourselves. Not looking for your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, that new commandment that He gives us. Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for His own advantage. Rather, the complete opposite, He made Himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. And see, Paul was writing these letters while he was in chains to a church that was still being affected by the world. We have always will be. We're all sinners saved by grace. And he was giving them these words of encouragement so that they wouldn't turn away. So they would stand firm in their faith. Because see, people were saying, oh, there's no resurrection of the dead. Jesus isn't coming back. He, he didn't ever uh, um, rise from the dead in the first place. Somebody stole his body, right? Something. But Paul was encouraging them so that they would encourage one another, so that they would be united. Not only united, but they would take the step further and think of others before they thought of themselves. Just as Christ did. Paul's plea in 1 Corinthians 1.10, if you didn't note it, had three elements to it. That you all, every one of us, every part of the body, not just some, speak the same thing. That you're united in the gospel message. And that there be, number two, no divisions among you. No, not one, not some, few, but no divisions. So we're all to be united and there are to be no divisions. And then we have verse, I mean the third thing, which is perfectly joined together. And in Greek, that's one thought. It is that wholeness. And he goes on, talks about the body and gives the example. There. But it's that wholeness that my body is complete. That I have everything that I need given from God to me through Jesus by the power of the Spirit. If you notice back in the first nine verses, it said that they had every spiritual gift they needed. But yet we'll read on in Corinthians that they argued and, and lusted after these other gifts because they didn't have this gift. God gave gifts the way He apportioned through His Spirit. If you don't have this certain gift, don't be envious of it. Support the person that does. And you know what? He may give you this gift down the road because He gives as He sees fit. But everyone is given a gift. 
so that they can serve one another. So that the body will be made whole, perfectly joined together. In the same mind or same judgment, <clears throat> we can get the basics down and then we can stamp out any divisions, but then we may have to mend or make whole as well. We have to go out of our comfort zone and love one another as Christ loved us. To put other people's needs above us so that we can be whole. So that we can be the church that God intended us to be. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, in chapter 4, verse 1, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you, I beseech you there again, I beg you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Being completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Paul's message is the same to each one of these churches. <laughs> Do you realize who you are as a child of God? Do you realize what a loving, faithful God that you serve? Who loves you beyond anything you can imagine. He loves you so much. <clears throat> if we read on in verse 14, it says, Then we will no longer be infants, because we should grow to that maturity. No longer tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunnings and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, the complete opposite, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is, Christ. From Him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work together. Perfectly joined together, complete with no divisions of the same mind and thought. Same purpose. <clears throat> Jesus said these words, and I'll remind you of them, you all know them. One is we call the Great Commission. It's found in Matthew 22, verses 36 through 39. So, teacher, who is the greatest commandment in the law? And what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, "Love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Because if you love one another, look at the Ten Commandments. The first ones are about God. Second ones are about people. Because if you understand God's plan, then you'll see His love." His plan of redemption through Christ. And how can you not love your brother? The second is like it. Love your neighbor. Did I forget something? As yourself. That is our great commandment that, the church, that as individuals we should thrive to live. And especially as the body of Christ. Then there's the Great Commission found in a few chapters later. Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, because of that, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Don't let anybody fool you. I am with you the whole way. I said it was finished and I mean it. If you believe in me, then you will spend eternity with God your Father in heaven. Perfect. <clears throat> so he said, make disciples. I've said before, whether you remember it or not, they were first called disciples way before they were ever called Christians because they acted like Christ. Disciple is one who chooses to follow <laughs> after their master or Lord. And if you believe that gospel message, you cannot deny that part that you're saying, I will become a disciple of Christ to follow after Him. 
John 3.16 is great quoting it alone, but go back and read the whole chapter, like I said, unless you are born again. You cannot be a disciple unless... I've got to get my, my thing back up here. You deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow Him. Luke 9.23, I'm pretty sure. If I'm wrong, you can correct me. I like that one. It's in two other Gospels, but I like that one best because it says daily. Because I need that reminder that it's daily. Sometimes, some days, it's every few minutes. Right? That's our call as a church. Is the Great Commission, the Great Commandment. To make those disciples so that we're training them up to follow after Jesus Christ. After our faith. So our faith better be what it's said to be. Or we're training them up to be half-hearted. Not wholehearted. So we go all the way back to the Old Testament again. I've given you this day life or death, blessings or cursings. It's up to you to choose. So reading 1 Corinthians 1.10 again, I'm going to read it in the NLT this time. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. We started out with Rose, and thank you for doing that, reading Jesus' prayer for the believers, for all believers, because we had a mission. He left and left His servants in charge and equipped them fully to do it with the riches of the kingdom of heaven given to us. And he's going to come back one day and see how what we did as those servants, as loyal believers. So he prayed not that they're taken out of the world or not anything else. And I put the verse down at the bottom of the prayer request so you could see it and contemplate it on this, this week as you're praying for those that need the prayer. That you realize that's what Jesus prayed. Was for us because of what we are going to face in life. Jesus also said this in Revelations chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, to the church. He said, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That was said to the church in Philadelphia. The church of brotherly love, no coincidence. The most positive letter that Jesus wrote. There was only other, one other positive one. And I, let me go on to say that. They were all positive because they said, all you got to do is come back to me. <laughs> but these didn't really have any condemnation in their behavior because this church was living brotherly love, united as they were called to be. So that's why he said to hold firm because all this that I'm telling you is a fact. I will come again and what you're going to receive because of who you are in me by God the Father, be anxious for, be living for. Let it motivate and desire your life so that you're not distracted and you don't live a life that is worthless, but you live a life of worth. I invite you all today to potluck, and then we will be having our society meeting. If you don't know what that means, we're a society. We might change it and call it our family meeting instead of society meeting. I like that better. <laughs> but we're seeing where God has called you or think God is calling you in this upcoming year to serve in the church. So we'll be electing some positions and stuff. Some of you are members of the church. Some aren't. That doesn't mean you can't come if you're not a member. It should make you think even more about, hey, if I'm coming here regularly, maybe I ought to become a member. And we'll have a new members class Hopefully coming up soon. 
We're waiting on Polly to get back to teach it with Sherry. They volunteered. So think about that. But you just have to be a member to hold certain positions. And the reason for that, again, is so that someone doesn't come in at first and hasn't spent much time with the family to be united in the mind and spirit and everything, that they don't get into a position where they shouldn't be, plain and simple. But we are all called to be part of, these, part of the members. Rose put down on her talent sheet that she would be willing to read Scripture. So you better believe I asked her to read Scripture. Get her out of her comfort zone and serve. She teaches at Awanas and everything. Yay! <laughs> because we're called to serve our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and be united as one family. So let's close in prayer. Father, I do thank you so much that you are so good. That your plan is complete. That you are trustworthy and faithful. And I just honor and praise you. I thank you for Jesus Christ. And I thank you for fully equipping us to be the body of Christ. To be that holy priesthood that you want us to be. And Father, I pray especially that this church realizes that call, that we realize the Great Commission, that we realize how we're supposed to love one another, and that this community, that Bonners Ferry, will see our love and come and grows to you. Not necessarily this church builds in numbers or anything else, but that we are the light of this community and that they see Jesus Christ in us. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our, our oneness as we stand. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. 